And circling back now to redistricting and other news from the Capitol this week, let's get into it with Keisha Kluke from Bloomberg Government. Thank you for being here, Keisha. Thanks for having me. So redistricting, I'm so glad we have so much time to talk about it. It's a, it's a mess. So we <laughs> talked about it at the top of the show about the decision kind of vaguely, but let's start there with what the decision, well, let's start first with what were they arguing in terms mm -hmm. of the, the people who were suing over the maps? What was their argument? Mm -hmm. And there's so many places uh, to go with this. Yeah. <laughs> because there are so many aspects of this story. Um, so basically, uh, the Republicans were suing because they said that the maps were jan gerrymandered and going against the state constitution, which requires them to be nonpartisanly created. Um, and they actually won uh, the case all the way up to the highest court, the Court of Appeals in New York. And um, the court basically got it on almost like a technicality. So the way that the process was is this independent redistricting commission, um, which is independent because there's essentially five uh, Republicans and five Democrats at the end of the day, um, hadn't it ha submitted a set of maps, set, submitted two sets, a Democratic set and a Republican set. Um, the legislature said, we don't like either of them. Go back and try again. Um, they said, we can't. <laughs> so. Which was like the whole, like, th that was the thing, is on the second round where the legislature was like, go back and try again, and the IRC, the Independent Redistricting Commission, was literally like, no. Yeah, there were, there were part of them who said, we want to come to the table, and another part who said, we can't, and then they were, it was just finger pointing, it was a mess. So at the end of the day, they didn't submit the second set of maps, which is how it's written in the Constitution. So then um, the legislature created its own maps. Now the legislature had its own committee who has done this for, for years and years, um, and they just created their own maps. Well, the legislature, um, both the Assembly and the Senate, are led by supermajority Democrats, so the Republicans voted against the map, so it was passed in a partisan manner. Mm -hmm. um, and basically the court said, you know, the Constitution <clears throat> lays out this process and you didn't follow the process. Um, and thus, in the end, the result was this um, nonpartisan um, gerrymandered, uh, or I'm sorry, partisan gerrymandered map. Which is so interesting because you're right, there are two parts to this where the first one was literally like, uh, the first part of the decision was literally like, you didn't do this the right way, so these maps are bad anyway. And then the second part was like, but even if you had done this the right way, like let's say that, I don't know, you voted down the maps and now you had to draw them. The court also said, well, you also drew them the wrong way too. Mm -hmm. Which was like, it, 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 it's so quintessential Albany to get this wrong. <laughs> This is the result, as we should remind people, of a constitutional amendment from a decade ago that was supposed to set up a truly independent process. But the problem with that commission was that the appointees were appointed by partisan members of the legislature. So it was almost a given from the start for a lot of people that this was going to end in a stalemate. So as we said earlier in the show, the Democrats are now out of legal options in terms of they don't have a higher court to go to for this. So what's the next step? Okay, so, well, it's, it's important to note that this um, case eventually ended up just um, being about the congressional maps yes. and the state senate maps. Yes. But the assembly maps, which, by the way, were created through the same process, are totally fine. Now, the assembly Republicans could sue, and this could set a precedent for them to sue, but they're pretty much happy with the maps. The maps were actually not too bad for assembly Republicans. So I think we won't see, I mean, anything could happen in New York, but I think we won't see a lawsuit on that. Um, but what that means is the way that it's set up now, there will be two primaries. Hmm. Uh, there will be one in June for the statewide offices, like governor, judges, things like that. Um, and then also the assembly maps. Now, at the same time, there will be um, a the lower courts, the Supreme Court has appointed someone to redraw the maps uh, for the Senate and the uh, congressional lines, and those will theoretically be in August. Now, here's the fun thing. Choose your adventure in New York um, <laughs> because there was a 2012 federal uh, court order that required New York State to have the congressional or the federal um, primaries in June to give enough time for the um, November election to send out those overseas military ballots um, absentee ballots ahead of time. Now, previously, New York had the primaries in September, and there wasn't enough time to do that, the court deemed. So New York changed it to have the primaries in June. We are not a stranger to two primaries. In 2018, for example, we had the state primaries in August and the congressional in June, just as the court ordered, and now we're looking at flipping it. However, 
it's a question of whether or not we can actually do that legally. So we could see yet another court case at the federal level. Um, and if that federal judge, hypothetically, were to rule in favor of having um, the June congressional maps, that would mean that the maps would stay as is, in which case, um, here's you're asking why is this important at all. Um, no, I'm, I'm enthralled. <laughs> yes, right now. I know there's so many uh, aspects to this story. So if they agree with Democrats and the um, races go on as continued on, on in June, um, that means that the Democrats nationally could potentially pick up additional seats in New York, which would offset some Republican gerrymandering in other, seat, in other states that was allowed to go forward, so they could potentially keep control of the House nationally. Now, in New York, um, it, if that were to happen, um, it could be a benefit for Kathy Hochul, who has a lieutenant governor. Um, who, yeah, that's what I, I was going to yeah. ask you. How does this play into that? So the problem mm -hmm. with the governor is that she doesn't have a running mate that she prefers. I don't want to say she doesn't like the two that she has as an option right now, but she's trying to find a way to get a, another candidate on the ballot for lieutenant governor. So is it a possibility now that we have the governor and the lieutenant governor primary also move to August with that, and that might give her an opening? So it depends on what happens. Um, as one of the uh, good government groups said, we're kind of in the fogs of war right now. Um, the dust hasn't settled and people haven't really decided what they could do. But the legislature could decide to move all of the uh, June races to uh, August, at which point we would have one primary, we'd save about 40 to $60 million, which would be beneficial to taxpayers. Um, and um, if allowed, so the question is, uh, the petitioning has already happened for the June primary in all of the races. The petitioning will need to be redone for the Senate and Congress. If they pass legislation, they may um, move it and change that petitioning process, in which case she could pick her, her lieutenant governor of choice. As it stands right now, she's out of luck. <laughs> it's such an interesting thing to watch all the moving parts because I can already see the talking points of moving the primaries from June to August, right? It's, it's what you said, saving the taxpayers money, which is a huge benefit, I mean, for everybody. The other one is giving everybody a little more breathing room. You know, you don't want to rush a process. And the third thing is really that primaries are low turnout elections as it is. So you have an election in June that we're not expecting a huge turnout for. And then suddenly late in the game, we're now adding this August primary. So it, it, are voters going to actually come out in June and in August and November. I think that's the question for everybody. Um, I'm just so excited to see what happens in the next few weeks with this, but we are out of time, unfortunately. Keisha Kluke from Bloomberg Government, thank you so much for being here.